All systems go. Alrighty. So my name is Jeremy, founder of a company called Make Games With Us, um, Y Combinator alum, MIT dropout, and uh, to my understanding, we're all here because you want to venture in uncharted territory and change the world. And I know, given where we are located and the students I've met from the school before, that many of you will want to do so at some point in your lives by starting a startup. I'm not that much older than you are, 22, and I started the company two years out of high school. And so I have a window into what could be the very near future for some of you. And I'm hoping to share five tips, five lessons for high school students who want to change the world by doing a startup. So, lesson number one is you should learn how to program. And you've heard this before. I know you've heard this before. Um, but it bears repeating. This is the most computing power that has ever been available to a high school student. And you have it in your pocket. It is more powerful than what we use to send humans to the moon. 30 years ago, this would have been considered a supercomputer, literally. They were computers the size of rooms. They were called supercomputers that were slower than my iPhone. And 30, 40 years before that, this would have been considered magic. If you walked around at the beginning of the 20th century with an iPhone, people would think that you could wield magic. And in a world where magic exists, there are people who know how to use magic, and there are muggles. <laughs> you want to be in category A. You want to know how to control the devices that can do millions of calculations per second, not those for whom those devices are a mystery. And every year that goes by, there are more and more industries out there that can be transformed, improved, revolutionized in some way by these devices that can perform millions of calculations a second. In fact, it's difficult to think of an industry that 10 years from now could not in some way be transformed by software by these devices that can do so many calculations per second. And you want to be in control of them. I know a lot of folks your age get into computer science or programming because the most visible manifestation of the power of computer science in your lives are video games. And so because you play them and you interact with them on a regular basis, they are the driving force behind your motivation to get into CS. Perhaps also because you want to get that AP credit, taking AP CS, look good on your college ad, maybe your parents are telling you you should do it. But by and large, those are the motivations that high school students have. And I want to give you some more. Um, no matter what industry you can think of, industry that you love or industries that produce things you love, could be games, of course, but also fashion, journalism, medicine, biology, economics, finance. All those fields, all those industries, the next startup to revolutionize them, to go big in them, has a 90 plus percent chance of having software as a core component of its competitive advantage. And I want to give one quick example of maybe a non-obvious place that CS is being used um, quite extensively. The New York Times has a very large development team and they're constantly hiring programmers. People to build their presence as a 21st century digital brand on mobile, tablets, the web. Also folks to create their beautiful interactive features, to build out their APIs. So even in a place that seems so not computer science-y, journalism, um, there's incredible room for software and computer scientists to have a huge impact. And that's just one example. So in high school, your horizons are APCS, League of Legends, as the full manifestation of the power of computer science. And I want you to look a little bit beyond that. Um, and when I say programming versus computer science, the really high level distinction um, is that programming is learning how to write code to produce an outcome that you desire. And computer science is, in really vague terms, the study of the mathematics behind the systems you can create while programming. And I strongly believe that everyone should learn how to program, and that those of you with the interest and mind for it can then learn, go on to learn computer science. It turns out that there are no programming courses that are different from computer science courses out there, as far as I know. So if you want to learn how to program, the best thing to do is to take a couple introductory computer science courses, and then figure out the kinds of things you want to build in the world. Do you want to program robots, apps, websites? Figure out what technologies are used to create those things, and then work backwards from those and teach yourself how to do them based on what you learned in those introductory computer science classes. That's what happens if you want to be a programmer. If you want to be a computer scientist, there's of course a lot of overlap. Um, the easy way is of course just to take computer science in college, pick up a minor or a major in it. So um, it's incredibly important in the startup world because like I said, 90% of any startup in any industry is highly likely uh, to have 
computer science and software as this competitive advantage. And uh, as a founder of a startup or someone who's gonna go work for one, you need to be well versed in how these systems work and be able to create things uh, with code to be competitive. Ah, nope, yes. All right, so the next lesson is to build things and ship things. If you're gonna create something that is gonna be used by real humans, you have to start developing the intuition the kind of person who understands how other humans interact with what they have created, all right? <laughs> Anytime that you struggle in the menu with a piece of software, it does not do what you want, you can't figure out how to change a certain setting, it is because the person who created that piece of software had an insufficient intuition as to how other humans think and designed it in such a way that was confusing. And the difference between a well-designed product that humans can understand and a poorly designed one can be the difference between a several billion dollar success and nothing. The way that you develop this intuition, the way to become good at this, is to start building things early and to ship them early so that you can observe other people interacting with the things you've created. They don't have to be big startup ideas. They can be really small side projects. But at the end of college, there is a huge difference in how hireable, how knowledgeable, and how successful students will be between those who have stopped at what class asked of them, those who just completed the problem sets, did the in-class assignments, and that was it. And those who went beyond, or around, and built things and released them. That could be apps, it could be websites, it could be really anything. But the way that you prove to yourself and to the world that you know how to use a certain technology is by building something in that technology and putting it out for others to use. And it also has the incredibly good side effect of starting to develop this intuition of how other people think. Because you will watch people interact with what you've created and realize that you really, really suck at it the first couple of times. You could be the best computer scientist in the world, but the first website you make is likely gonna be semi-unusable. The first app you make is gonna have design errors, and the only way to realize this is to actually do it for the first time and release it. If you've done this many times before you go try to start your startup, by the time you're doing it for real in a context that matters, you'll already know the do's and don'ts. So build things, ship things. Lesson number three is to not blindly match the patterns you observe around you. Parents of the audience are probably wincing when I was introduced as a college dropout, and they get a lot of media attention. These college dropouts who go on to succeed, isn't that awesome, right? The Zuckerbergs, the Jobs, the Gates, weren't all the successful people college dropouts? The answer is no, actually. It turns out that it's a, a false pattern. So um, you could go out and say, hey, all the successful startup founders were college dropouts. I'm in college. I want to be a successful startup founder. <laughs> Maybe I should drop out. And then you look at someone like me who's talking to you, you're like, ah, proof, that's how it's done. Um, the truth is that that pattern actually does not exist. So it's a cosmic coincidence, perhaps, that the uh, startups that have produced the products you're most familiar with, Facebook, Apple computers, Windows, um, happen to have been founded by uh, college dropouts. But it turns out that the vast majority of the startup world most of the billions of dollars of value that have been created in the past 20 years by startups have been created by folks who graduated college. At Y Combinator, the average age of founders is actually in their late 20s. So these are people who have graduated college, gone on to work in the real world, and then started a company. There's no real rush to start a company, and I don't think there's anything that we know of that says that college dropouts or young founders like me are more successful or more common. I think that in fact on average we are less successful and less common, so double whammy. If I succeed, I will actually be breaking the pattern, not confirming one. The danger behind trying to match the patterns you observe, one, can be that the pattern doesn't exist. You look at the media, you listen to the common wisdom, and you get an incorrect impression of how the world works. For example, that all the startup founders don't have a college. It simply isn't true. If you try to imitate that, you're in big trouble because you're following something that doesn't actually exist. But the second reason that it's actually quite dangerous to try to operate that way is that you might be observing a pattern that in fact does exist, but you'll be following it incorrectly because you will confuse cause and effect and do the things that from the outside you can observe without understanding the true things behind the scenes that make that pattern valuable. A really simple example is college. The value of college is to take classes that interest you, meet fantastic peers, have interesting discussions in the late of the night, Find people with whom you can work on projects and build things, labs to do research at, all these wonderful extracurriculars. If you go to a good college, 
but you stay in your room and play League of Legends the whole time, you will not get any of the value of going to a good college. Someone who went to community college, who went to all their classes, met all their peers, did all the extracurriculars, would get more value out of that community college than you ever would out of MIT. So if you observe a pattern from the outside, oh, everyone who goes to MIT seems to be successful, I should go to MIT. But then you miss all the fundamental reasons why that actually makes someone successful. You're liable to go out and try to match your pattern, imitate something you've observed, without doing any of the things that actually bring value to you. And that is extremely dangerous and unfortunate. In the startup world, we also have issues around this. The startups that you know of are the ones that you use. You know the Snapchats, the Facebooks, the Instagrams. And so you have an impression of what a startup must look like from the outside, what a startup must be like. And so if you want to do one yourself, you might try to imitate the things that you can see from the outside world without doing any of the things that make those startups successful. A startup isn't just an app. It turns out that the vast majority of startups I know of are not. But the vast majority of startups you know of are. And the reason is that the startup world is much, much larger than social apps and mobile apps. It's not just Facebook, it's not just Instagram, it's not just Snapchat. But those are the ones that you're familiar with because your young high school students are the ones that you use. It turns out that startups can target a variety of industries. I know construction startups, fashion startups, e-commerce startups, medical device startups, biotech startups, farming startups, dating startups. What do they all have in common? What makes them all a startup? A few things. One, software is usually part of their competitive advantage. Two, they target really fast growth, so they're trying to dislodge an existing player in an industry or create a new industry. So they want to grow maybe 10% month on month. They want to be worth tens, hundreds of millions of dollars within a few years. And the third thing is they tend to get funding from what are called venture capitalists, the kind of investors who are willing to invest in companies where nine out of 10 will be worth zero and one out of 10 will be worth hundreds of millions if not more. Most of the ideas that will naturally come to you as high school and college students for startups are not good startup ideas. They're patterned off of the problems you observe in the world and the startups that you observe, both of which are only representative of a very, very small subset of the full startup world. Why is that? You mostly know high school and college students, so you will naturally try to make things that appeal to high school and college students. This is true of you now, it's true of you for the next few years, because even the seniors are going to be in the college educational world for a few more years. Turns out that college students, for example, are mostly between 18 and 22. It turns out that most of the population in the world and most of the money in the world belongs to people who are between 22 and dead. So, there's an overabundance of college students who are trying to do the startup thing, all creating startups that appeal to college students, targeting this very, very narrow age range and very narrow demographic of very broke people who don't pay for things, and are ignoring the massive demographic of 22 to dead year olds who have all the money and all the spending power and all the problems in the world that college students never try to solve. There are many billion dollar problems in this world and few college students are trying to solve them. And I'm convinced this is why most startup founders in Y Combinator are in their late 20s, because it takes a while of exposure in the real world to actually discover things that you could create that would be useful to people who can actually pay you money for the privilege. That's typically not college students. I want to give you a couple of examples. So in my batch of Y Combinator, there was a company called Farmlogs. They realized that farmers have a lot of problems that can be solved by software. The typical farmer you imagine is someone who has a plot of land the size of this room. But in fact, farming is a massive industry with people who are very technologically savvy, who have fields that are huge beyond the scope and ability of one individual person to keep track of. If you could automate, give them a dashboard where they could see where they've planted which seeds, how much they've watered which plants, what fertilizer they're using where, what the yield was, who they've sold to, how many people they're employing, where their tractors have been, so on and so forth, and you could sell them a product that would do that for them in a beautiful way, you could make a lot of money. And that's what Farm Blogs does. Why isn't this a startup you've heard of before? Because college students who play around with Snapchat, Instagram, and Facebook don't think of what if I could solve these massive problems for this billion dollar industry because most of you are not farmers, right? There's a company in my batch who was called uh, Grouper. And Grouper was founded by a gentleman who was not a fan of the current landscape in online dating and wanted something a little bit more casual. And in Grouper, you get matched with someone of the gender you're interested in, and both parties meet up 
with two friends each. So it's a three on three. The nerds in you might appreciate the combinatorially increased chances of a successful match. Um, and it's much less awkward because worst case scenario, you're you know, at a bar with two friends. And best case scenario, you meet someone that you really like. What is this? It's not an app. It's not just a website. It's a service that has incredible challenges in setting up. You need to negotiate with bars and where you're going to send people, you know, the people on their dates. You need to do manual matching. There's a lot of problems that are not computer science-y. But behind the scenes, software underpins it all. And it's not one of these obvious college startup ideas. What are obvious college startup ideas? What you will see when you get to college that every single campus has at least one of is a Tinder for something that is not sex. So Tinder for roommates, Tinder for textbook exchange, Tinder for something. A textbook exchange service, someone will be doing that as a startup. A Craigslist, but more specifically for something college students want, like textbook exchange, furniture exchange, clothes. You're going to see all of these on campus and more. These are amazing side projects. I'd be contradicting myself if I said don't do these. They're amazing things to build, to release, to see how people use, but they're not necessarily good startup ideas. A good startup is something you stick with for six to eight years. The highs I can't speak to, but the lows are guaranteed to be lower than the safe path at a big tech company. And so if you're doing something for six to eight years, you need to make sure that you're actually passionate about it. That you can live through the lows because you really enjoy the highs, and that it's something you truly care about, that you would use this, or that you deeply care about the fact that there are people in the world who would use this. My last piece of advice is surround yourselves by makers and doers. You're kind of the average of the five people around you that you spend the most time with. If they go to the gym, eat healthy, ship code, and are very intellectual, you will probably go to the gym, eat healthy, ship code, and be very intellectual. Figure out what you aspire to, figure out what you wish you were doing, and then find the kinds of people who have the same dreams and are doing the same things. If you're into film, don't find the folks who are just thinking about it, find the people who are making short films. If you're into chemistry, biology, the sciences, find people who are doing research, not just those who go to class and get good grades. If you're into programming, find the people who go to hackathons, ship products, release things on GitHub, and hang out with them. And that will change immeasurably the next four years of your life as you go through college. So that's my piece of advice. Learn how to program. Don't match the patterns around you. Make sure not to stop at the obvious startup ideas. And surround yourselves with the kinds of people that you want to be. And uh, I hope to see several successful startups founded out of the folks in this class or in this room. But I suspect that it will take another 10 years. Because on average, as you've learned, you will do it sometime in your late 20s. So that's me. My email is jeremy at Make Games With Us. And you're more than welcome to get in touch with any questions. And I'll be around during the session afterwards as well. Thank you.